guys have made it, and I'm glad you're here. We continue to pray for this community and that the community will find some value here at the <coughs> House of Prayer. So we will continue to pray for them. We had a visitor this morning, I guess, passing through town from out of Wisconsin. He said his name was Brian, so let us pray for Brian and, and his safe travels wherever it is he's going. Uh, does anybody have any prayer requests or any concerns? Is there anywhere we can get the dog to quit working? It's a little sexy. Yeah. 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 The goodness of God to manifest Himself in, in our lives and throughout our lives. I know God is good and wonderful and is always doing great things for us and with us and, and surrounding us with all kinds of, of good stuff. Uh, even, even empowering the doctors and nurses to to see that uh, Ira is, as of now, you know, cancer-free, which we believe is all due to the power of prayer and God's <coughs> good love in, in your life, you know. Don't ever underestimate the good things God is doing in your lives. Throughout the past couple of weeks, we've been dedicated to once saved, always saved, is that a biblical principle, and, and as we look into it, and the more we look into it, the more we see how true that really is. That after Christ has saved you, that salvation it, it is locked and secured forever. Once saved, always saved is a biblical principle, and to deny that is to deny and reject God's word and even Christ himself. And, and so I think a lot of people who lack that security lack it because, one, they don't know what the Word of God says. They're living as according or in accordance to their opinions, the opinions that they have created a, about God instead of finding out who the one true God is. So those kind of people, they only believe and a God of their approval. And so they go out and they seek and they search throughout everything and everywhere, and it's never God until we approve of it, and then it's God. So it's a creation of the delusions of their own imagination. It's an idol. It's called idolatry. Those same people are always trying to establish their own virtue, and righteousness, and, and, and it's established by diminishing you and, and your faith and, and who you are as a person. They establish their justification to live in sin. Instead of turning away from sin, that they are complete hypocrites in how they try to justify their sin. And so how do they justify their sin? Well, the reason I didn't help you out, or I don't help you out, or I don't do good for you, you're not worthy of it. You're, 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 you're not good. You're living unrighteously. You're living in, in bad behavior. And I pray for God to give me discernment, and the discernment God has given me is I am justified, I am well, I am okay by not displaying a sense of good to you in your life because you're not worthy of it. And so we're always 
They're seeking to justify their sins instead of doing what they have been called to do. So, by your fruits, you'll be known. What do you produce? And as good people and people seeking salvation, will you ever find security or assurance when you come seeking for fruit on a thorn bush and a sticker plant? It always leaves you with a sense of pain and discomfort. You can't find comfort in the midst of a thorny bush, and it doesn't produce fruit. Nothing bad, no bad tree, no bad person can produce good. And the same with the good tree. No good tree can produce bad. It's going to produce good. And so recognize where is your fruit coming from and, and who are you seeking to, to hear and listen to. You know, it, it's a problem for me when the people who dedicate their lives to Jesus Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ are your enemies. Muhammad is not your enemy. The, the Islam nation is not your enemy. Hinduism is not your enemy. Buddhist, it, it, Buddhism is not your enemy. All these false and fake and phony religions is not your enemy. Uh, mediums, tarot card readers, palm readers, fortune tellers, that's not your enemy. No, your, your enemy is the guy who dedicated his life to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That should, should be where you get your discernment from. That, that should tell you right there. If you go to that person seeking for hospitality, help, kindness, gentleness, goodness, patience, love, joy, you're probably not going to find it. You're not going to find it from there. And, and if you're always going and returning back to that place seeking for security and salvation, or even God's word, you're never going to find it. So let us open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for all the great things you're doing in our lives. We thank you for the wonderful people you have placed around us in our lives. And we thank you, Father, for all those good stuff. We thank you for the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat. Yes, great Father, we thank you for this house of worship and this place where we are most welcome to come and pray. And we come to you, Father, in prayer because we believe you are present here in this place. And so in that we find our comfort, we find our strength, we find our hope. We find all things beautiful in this life through your presence. And for that, we thank you. We welcome you, Father. Come, fill this house with your holiness. Fill this house with your goodness. Fill my mind with your wisdom, my mouth with your word, and my heart with your spirit. Lead us and guide us wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. I got a little song to kind of warm up our hearts. And so listen to this song as we prepare ourselves for today's message. Oh, well, Travis comes back and then kicks kick him out of his mouth. <laughs> Don't stick creeping outside. No offense to him, he's not the dog. He's a, he said he likes that job. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, anyway. So we see even in Psalm, Right? All of the days of our life forever. The Lord is with us. He guides us. He, he gives us the strength and, and the ability to do things we just could not do without, on our own power and, and our own strength. You know? He, when He's with us, gives us the ability to walk through the valleys 
of those shadows of death, you know, the, the shadow is, is always changing. And so the, the weapon of death, which are the wages of sin. So, so the wages of sin, as many people say or, or think, in death or through death it is the separation between us and God. Because God is life and God is a life-giving spirit. So the opposite of life is death. And so with that comes the wages of sin. And, you know, many people say, well, why? What's the point in, in Christ? And for those who are perishing, those who have no assurance at all in salvation, it's just foolishness. And they don't recognize it and they don't understand how, how if Christ had not come and he did not take on the sin of the world, we would all be lost. You know, when we talk about iniquity, it, it is my inability to be moral. I don't have the, the ability within me to, to make a morally sound choice. And, and everything we, we do as a people, when, when God is absent from us, God's not working in us and through us, by the presence of the Holy Spirit, I, I look, just think about this, okay? When, when you think of, of Jesus Christ, and for a lot of my life, Jesus Christ well, was the word I used, you know. Jesus Christ, you dirty sons of a bum. Why are you doing that? Jesus Christ, why are you? And all of it, it's profaning him. It is, the name of God is not sacred, it's not holy, it's a cursed word. It's the word I use to express anger and disappointment and disrespect. And, and, and so many Christians and non-Christians like people all through the world, if, if I had the opportunity to make a morally sound choice, I, I, I'm not going to make it. The, the only ability I have within me is to choose that which is wrong. I'm, I'm born in iniquity. I explained it to this week as blindness, okay? So you're born blind and you're born deaf. You cannot see and you cannot hear. And there you are, this little kid trying to, to rummage, rummage around the world and you can't see what's coming, you can't see what's in front of you. You don't know the difference between uh, danger and not danger. Here's heavy traffic flowing, and, and your mom and your dad, and you're standing there. There's your little kid, and he loves that little child. He's out there, and he's going, and he's walking out, and he's going to walk right out onto the street. Now, now, am I taking away that child's free will by running out there and, and grabbing that child and pulling them out of harm's way? Am I forcing my love on that person? Am I removing their free will? And I don't think, one, we have free will. We have the illusion of free will. So now, when we talk of free will, okay, there's a child, he's blind, and he cannot hear. Is he a slave to that condition? A slave to that condition. Does he have free will? I mean, there's so many of us. We, are, are you a slave to the condition of becoming sick? Can, can you live your life in such a way and, and do all these wonderful exercises and eat all this wonderful great food and, and never become sick? Or, or are you a, a slave to the condition that one day you will become sick? And in fact, you, you're a slave to the condition of death that one day you will die. And, and there's no escape from that. And, and no matter how healthy I live my life, no matter how many miles I jog, or how many days I spend at the, the gym lifting weights and, and doing, I'm a slave to a condition, a will.
greater than my own. I can't even choose not to do that. I can't choose not to be sick. In the same way a child who's blind says, I can't choose not to see. Even if I wanted to see, I can't choose to see. Even if I wanted to hear, I can't choose to hear. So I, I can't as a parent go in there, whoa, whoa, stop. Right? They can't see me. Can't see my warning. Can't hear my voice. I'm just going out and doing what would I feel like is normal. And what's normal? I'm just going to bumble my way through the world the best I, I know how. And with my free will and my free choice, I'm just going to go over here. And right over here, you've got the highway and cars roaring by. Now, now I'm a parent and I love you. And I don't want to see you harmed. I don't want to see you get hurt. And so I go out there and I know your condition. And your mama and your daddy, I, I know everything about you. I know if I yell, and I yell really loud, you still can't hear me. If I sit there and I wave my arm, stop, stop, you cannot see me. So I physically go out there and I grab hold of you and I'll pull you back. Right? Did I take away your free will? Did I force my love upon you unjustly and unrighteously? Now, if I wanted to punish you, I'd put you in a, in a cage and in a jail. You don't leave the cage. You can't come out of the jail. We see it all the time even in our own world, right? Murderers go to prison because they make some society unsafe. It's not safe for the rest of us to be around you. So you forfeit all of your rights, your freedom, your, your free will. You, you sit there and you don't get to decide when you go to the bathroom. You, you go when we let you. You don't get to decide what you eat. You eat what we give you. You don't get to decide where you go. You, you do whatever we tell you to do. And for today and forevermore, you just sit there and shut up and don't complain. And if you complain and you don't obey, I'm going to send, you know, Bubba in, and Bubba will shut you up. Right? That's life. And that's punishment. And one, in order to punish you, I have to own, own the power and the authority to do that. And then if I have the power and authority to punish you, I also own the power and authority to show you mercy. To, to not punish you. Now, discipline, right? Good dad, good father, good mother disciplines their children. God disciplines us. So here you got that blind child, who's deaf and blind, and you want to discipline them. And what is discipline? It's putting roadblocks in the way. Right? We're going to detour you away from harm. That's why we discipline. When we're teaching our children and we're disciplining them, and we swap them on the butt, it's not that I want to hurt you or, or abuse you. I'll give you a small taste of what the pain could be if you continued on. I'm not going to give you the full amount of the harm or the... the destructiveness of an 18 ruler bouncing its wheels over your back, instead I'm going to give you a little spank on the button. This is what it, a little bit of what it could be and it's supposed to deter us from continuing down that path. They could put thumbtacks, right? A whole bunch of little thumbtacks on, on the, the edge of the road. And so when my little child is deaf and blind, bare little feet come walking up, Steps on the duck tags and oh, 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 it backs them up. I can't see it, I can't hear it, but I can certainly feel that. And so it deters me from following down this path of destruction. That's how God works. That's how God works in all of our lives. And sometimes the roadblocks are a display of His love. 
It's just as Jesus said, you know, we have a fruit tree. And there's the owner of the garden. He comes out. Where is my fruit? This tree will not produce any fruit. Cut it down, he says to the gardener, and throw it away. And the gardener says, well, let's, let's show the tree mercy. It's only been here for a short while. Let's give it another year. What I'll do is I'll, I'll dig a trench around it, and, and I'll fertilize it. And what's fertilizer? It's always the best for the poop. So we use the poop, and we put it around the tree, and maybe that, that, that's, that's our lives. And, and every time I, I, I go to not produce fruit, I, I produce thorns and thistles, the things that are contrary to what God desires for our lives, and, and I try and step out, we run into the wall of poo, and, and it's bad. And, and, and oh, it's a very negative reaction. Very negative thing happens. You know, it, it's <clears throat> in the way, like every time I say to God, I pray to God, bless us with finances. You know, Lord, I, I want you to know and recognize we've got some financial difficulties. And, and, and it's always, I, I, from when we lived in Inglewood to even living here, it doesn't matter. Somebody knocks on the door and says, where's my share? <laughs> Hello. Who are you? Don't worry about who I am. I'm just a stranger I'm on a great journey traveling through this world. This is not my home. All right? So we always entertain angels because we're strangers because we don't know if they're angels, right? And the angels always comes to us as a stranger. And, and, and what, what, you, you want my help, says the Lord, right? You want my help? Okay. Johnny, go over there and let's see how serious David was about my help. So Johnny knocks on the door. The Lord said you were really in need of financial gain and if you just placed a little money in my hand, Maybe, maybe he would help you, right? Do unto others what, what we wished they would do to us. And, and so we beg God for help, and, and then Johnny's knocking on our door. Get out of here, you! Guy, tattoos all over. I don't have to help you. I don't have to show you a sense of, of hospitality or help. And, and then all of a sudden, you know, Four months later, Father God, are you gonna bless us with some financial help? What? <laughs> Say something. John, are you talking about? <laughs> you can talk about Bill Wills. <laughs> right? Yeah, so, so that's how it happens, and that's how it works. And that's how God knows if we're serious or not. You know, I, I, we're supposed to be a, a viable vessel being used by God <coughs> to, to display light in, into a dark world. And, and our light needs to be kindness and gentleness, patience, joy, a sense of charity and generosity. Goodness given, expecting nothing in return. So as a father, he goes and he stops his child. It's not him forcing his will on this child or his love on this child. It, it, it is a sense of charity, a gift given, expecting nothing in return. You would have thanked me. You would have appreciated me had you seen the danger I deterred you from. And that's what we find in Jesus Christ. That God is holy. God is righteous. And God does not just simply forgive sin. He, Jesus Christ paid the penalty for our sins. He atones for the sin. And that's what we, we should see and that would, would and should be the thing that deters us from sinning. I, I see Jesus Christ suffering on the cross. And that's supposed to deter us. That's supposed to stop us from sinning because 
God said, this is the solution to your sin. Christ crucified. And, and, and displays to us in Christ a man without blemish, a man without sin, a man who was perfect. If there was a person, a thing created by God that knew how to choose what is morally right always, every time. He has the ability not only to choose from right and wrong, but always chooses what is right. So he's the only one with free will. Since Jesus even says, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. You sin because you're a slave to it. And that's our lives and that's what we do. So, so Christ comes in the world to set us free. You know, I, I think of it all kind of like this. I can complain a lot, but I think more and more as I get older, I find more rest with God in my presence. You know, so many times we, we think money is going to be the answer to our problems. Right? So, so there you got the Egyptian, or the, the Israelites in Egypt back in the days of Moses. They're crying out, oh, we are slaves. We are slaves to a condition, a will greater than our own. And, and, and boy, if, if we just had got paid more money, and we had more possessions, right, things would, would be just fine. And, so they cry out to the Lord their God, and what did God do? Right? He sent Moses with a bag full of gold. Right? No. He sent Moses with his presence. Not presence is Christmas presence, but God's manifestation in, with being with Moses. He sends to them himself. This is the answer to your problems. And so when people don't have security in salvation, it's because they're trying to establish their salvation through their own righteousness, their own goodness. I'm removing God. I'm going to completely remove God and I can do this on my own. And how do I justify my sin? Well, you're not worthy of my time. You're, you're, you're not worthy of my hospitality. You're, you're not worthy of my money or, or my goodness, my kindness. That's how, that's how I justify it. That's how I establish my righteousness. And yet all the while we see with God and with Moses, how did he establish the righteousness of, of the people of Israel? By, by delivering them out through the power of God. And he didn't give them more money, didn't give them gold. In fact, all the gold and the silver they took from Pharaoh, from Egypt, and out with them out into the wilderness, it was turned into a false god. It was turned into an idol. They wanted that idol, that thing to go before them to secure their way. And yet, that was determined by God to be destroyed. They, they found everything they needed in God. God provided the meat. God provided the manna. Of Israel, they don't have radio or television. But this is what they had in common. They never knew each other. They never hung out with each other. But they all spoke the same message. And this is why it's brought in and brought into the canon or the Bible. They were speaking the same thing about the same God. God saying, this is what you did. This is what you're doing. And he doesn't say, if you continue on this path, you're, you're going to walk yourself right into a, a roaring highway full of, of cars and you're going to be destroyed. 
He said, while, while, while you had the choice for free will, you walked out into the street and you were utterly destroyed. So what you did. You profaned my name. You didn't have any reverence for me. When people sought me and they sought holiness and they sought refuge in the Lord, here, here you are using my name as a sense of profanity. And yet, you're the one who says, I love God. I love God. And then we wonder, why do people not come to church? So God says it like this. Ezekiel saying, The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, when the house of Israel lived in their own land, they defiled it by their ways and their deeds. Their ways before me were like an uncleanliness of a woman in her menstrual impurities. Disgusting, says the Lord. This is what it looked like, and this is what it was like when we walked in the presence of the Lord, displaying the holiness of God to the world. It was utterly disgusting. So I poured out my wrath upon them for the blood that they had shed in the land, for the idols with which they had defiled. I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through their countries. In accordance with their ways and their deeds, I judged them. But when they came to the nations, wherever they came, they profaned my holy name. And that people said of them, these are the people of the Lord, and yet they had to go out of his land? But I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations which they came. Thus, therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord. And so, so in all of it, God's saying, this is what you did, and, and, and I poured out my wrath upon you. I, I judged you as according to what you did and as according to what your deeds. And, and had Jesus Christ not come and taken the punishment, everything you see would have been casted into the lake of fire with no return, with no hope. Sure, if we could be good, if we could display a sense of goodness and righteousness, God would reward us with everlasting life. If we could live by the law and everything that is entailed to the law, and in the law we were in right standing with God, we would have no worries or problems with entering into eternal life with God. The problem is, we're incapable, can't do it, unable. The best we could do was make God look bad. And all of it, and does sickness, does death represent the goodness of God? Does it display to the world, to all of creation, that there's an all-powerful God who's full of goodness? And certainly doesn't. It's for that reason Jesus came into the world to die, to be crucified. That's the measure that exposes our sin. He is perfect, he is without sin, he's the only being in, in creation that has free will. And what is Christ? 
the manifestation of God's word in reality, in flesh. God has free will. We are slaves to a condition. We have the illusion of free will, but we're slaves to the condition. We're slaves to sin and, and evidence of it. We're, we're slaves to sickness. We're slaves to death. We're slaves to a will far greater than our own. And yet all those things cannot, does not represent the love of God. And so God said, this is what I'm going to do. I will take you from the nations, and I will gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put within you. Again, this is God. What is the work of God? What is God doing? Because you are unable. I am going to do something. Not because you're righteous, not because of your virtue, not because you're good, not because you deserve it. That's why we, we call it grace. This is what God says I will do. I will put a new heart in you a heart of flesh, a heart where, where the rules and the laws of God are written upon that. When God says, you, you shall not profane my holy name. Yeah, when I go out into the world, there was a time when the name of Jesus Christ was a customer, but now the name of Jesus Christ is the power of my salvation. It is holy and it's worthy of reverence. It's worthy of love. That, that is evidence God is present in me. When God says, love me with all of your heart, with all of your mind, your strength, and your soul, I now have the power and the ability to do that. I wake up every morning and I dedicate my life to God. I give myself to you. I check in with the Master. What do you have me do today? Where do you want me to go today? Who do you want me to feed today? Who do you want me to help? Why would God be gracious enough to help us unless we were willing to help someone else? God says be hospitable, right? Be hospitable to the stranger, be good to the stranger, be good to the soldier, those who are traveling and passing by. You never know. And an angel comes knocking on your door. And they come unannounced. They come without your approval. You know, that's how you know it's from God. Nobody wanted to hear from Ezekiel. Nobody wanted to hear from Jeremiah or Isaiah or any of the rest of the prophets. They, they came under the authority of God. The word of God came to me. And then he sent me out to, to proclaim to you what he said. People who are right with God are going to do to you exactly what they did to Jesus Christ. They'll kick you out of their synagogues. They'll kick you out of their churches. You won't be welcome there. They will destroy you. They will break you down. They will say all kinds of bad things about you, lies and different things in order to tear down your reputa repu reputation. But they won't help you. They won't show you any hospitality, but fear nothing because God is our truth. God is our strength. God is our hope. God is with us. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. This is God producing his fruits through us. Just as Jesus says, I am the vine, and everyone connected to the vine is holy because the vine is holy, the root is holy. And so are the branches. 
And so we look at one another and we look at the things we do for one another as acts of holiness. So maybe some of the greatest things we could do to shine the light of God is be kind, to smile, to be generous, to be charitable, to be loving, to be full of joy. Because there's so many people out there lacking kindness, lacking charity, lacking joy. Never profane the name of God. And I pray and hope that everyone within our community, within our church, would see that it's not me complaining. It's God asking you to display to this dark world your reverence, your desire to see them and display to the world sacredness, something sacred, holy. He is sacred. He is holy. You will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God, and I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness. This is what God says, this is what I'm going to do. This is the promise. So I were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of our sin, the, re the forgiveness of our sin. But the transformation comes from God in our heart, God in our presence. It's evidence that, that God is here. No one has seen the face of God, but we can be sure God is with us. And we produce his fruit. And we obey his rules. And we obey his laws. When we do unto others what we would have them do unto us. That's where all the law and everything rests upon that. So if Jesus Christ comes into the world and says, let me display, when, when I say love God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, all of your strength, and love one another, right? Jesus doesn't come and, and says, love me. He says, everyone who loves me loves God, but instead he loves you. He loves you with all of his strength, with all of his might, with all of his, his thing and, and his power, his soul, his being. And how does he display that love? By, by, by holding back the wrath of God. By taking on the wrath of God. By taking on the penalty we, we were so due. I'm going to take the wrath of God. I'm going to take the punishment of God. And in that giving you grace, I expect nothing of you. I'm not forcing my will. I'm not forcing my, my, my being, my love on you. I'm, I'm being a good father. And I'm doing everything it takes to protect you from being destroyed. I think I'm the... And then he says, now that I've absorbed the wrath of God and you've been reconciled with God and you're in right standing with God and, and you're no longer dirty, you're no longer disgusting, you can come to God without fear or, or shame or guilt. You come to your Father because he loves you. Love as I have loved you. Love one another with all of your strength, soul, being, and power. Why? Because God has declared you as holy and sacred. What made you holy? What made you sacred? Jesus Christ, willing to lay down his life for your salvation. Is what gives us assurance and security in salvation. It is eternal. It's eternal. It will never be taken away from you. It was never yours to lose. <laughs> if God gave it to you 
and, 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 and it was upon you to, to keep it, and to hold it, and protect it, and you would have lost it. You're incapable of making the moral choice to hang on to it. And so he hangs on to you. And he holds you. And he makes himself holy and sacred by being with you. That's what makes you holy, right? There's no darkness in God. There's no sin in God. No evil in God. And yet God says, I'm, I'm in you. I'm alive in you. Now what's stopping you from believing you're sacred, you're holy, you're good? Not only do we not use the name of God as profanity, stop saying bad things about yourself. Don't say bad things about yourself. Because in profaning the name of God, who lives and dwells in you, speak life over yourself and your family and everyone who comes in. Right? Money is never the answer or the solution to our problems. Right? Here's the people with both problems. God in your heart is the solution to your problems. And when you see that as worthy of sacredness and holiness and reverence, God responds. You are faithful, you are a good steward with a little, thereby he gives you more. He gives you more to be faithful with, to be a good steward of. And so keep that in mind. When you ask God to help you with finances and Johnny comes walking in and knocking on the door and says, where's my share? God's saying, what are you faithful with? What are you a good steward with? Why should I give you many why should I give you a lot if you're not going to be faithful or good steward with a little? And that's how God works. Romans And then he says, I will give you grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the increase of the field abundant, that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves for the iniquities and your abominations. It is not for your sake that I will act, declares the Lord God, let it be known to you, be ashamed and confound for your ways, O house of Israel. Again, God saying, I do these things because I love you. I forgive you because I love you. I removed my wrath from raining out on you because I love you. Not because of what you've done, not because of what you might become, but because I love you. And that's why he does these things. That's why he reminds us of our wrongdoing. It's not to shame us. It's not to make us feel bad or guilty. It's to remind us that the love of God is agape. It is unconditional. It's undeserved. You can't earn it. And you certainly can't lose it. It's his will to give to whoever, to whoever he so chooses. He chose you. That's what he says. I chose you. He did not choose me. I chose you. And I chose to save you. Believe it and be saved. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word 
and the security we find in Jesus Christ. He is our salvation. He is our strength. He is our hope. And in him, we freely come to you, O oh Lord, because we know it was in him you revealed yourself to us. And so in Jesus, we see you. We see your perfection. We see your love. We see your grace. We see your salvation. We see the power of it. We see the power of your salvation in Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, paying for our sins. We see the power of your mercy. And for that, we are thankful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your life, your time, and your love. Thank you for allowing us to know your name. Place within us a spirit and a heart to proclaim to the world you are sacred, you are holy, and you are the power of our salvation that endures forever. Thank you, Jesus. And amen. We got a couple of songs to listen to that uh, just reconfirm. That by the power of God's Spirit, He's doing something, He's moving. And He's not just saying these things through me, but through the many. Same message, same word, same God. It's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is our deliverer. 